Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a young Donald Trump fan who became a little bit of notoriety because he was posting some social media, which actually got quite a bit of attention to the point that Newsweek commented on him. And Newsweek said some things that has made our young Donald Trump fan unhappy. So he's suing for defamation, false light, and a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to read this lawsuit brought and see whether or not our young friend can recover. So let's get started with this. During the 2016 presidential campaign, CM got a lot of attention. Before he had even turned 12, he had publicly endorsed now President Donald Trump and released videos seen by thousands. In one popular clip, CM called Hillary Clinton deplorable, which, you know, seems fair because she called a lot of Donald Trump fans deplorable. So, you know, turning turning around a, fair, a, a good phrase seems fair. That video went viral, attracting more than 325,000 views on Facebook alone. From Russian television stations to Philadelphia magazines, many wanted to hear from Philly's biggest Trump supporter. CM obliged. In an interview with Philadelphia magazine, he said, Madonna needs to leave the country. That would help make America great again. She's trash. She said she wanted to blow up the White House. I don't know about that last part, but she may have been one of those people who said that if Donald Trump won, she would leave the country. There's a lot of them did. I'm not sure any of them actually followed through, but, you know, fair enough. After being asked why his Facebook post used the same kind of vitriol that CM had said is tearing the country apart. So he, they're saying, why are you using the same kind of language that you say others were using to tear apart the country? You know, fair point. Like, you know, wh why is it okay for you to use this language, but not others? So what does CM say? CM says, look, it's just a joke. They're calling Donald Trump a psychopath. They say he's mentally unfit. They're demonizing the Republican Party. They're saying most Republicans are racist. The people I talk about in these posts really have it coming to them. Which, you know, I have to say, with all due respect to CM, does seem a little special pleading. It's special pleading, right? Because the, the, what special pleading basically is like, I'm making an argument for me that doesn't apply to other people, right? So the problem is that this same argument would work the other way around, right? If there was a Democrat equivalent to CM who was doing this and said, well, you had it coming to you, right? The, the argument applies both ways. So it's a special pleading. It's logic, logically fallacious. So it's like, you know, if they have it coming to them, then other people do too, and you can't complain, you know? So so, the, so your logic needs a little work. But then again, you're under 12. So, I, you know, we'll give you, we'll give you a slight break on that. But, you know, if you want to play in an adult arena and you want to play in adult issues like politics, you know, I have no objection to that. You know, when I was 11, 12 years old, I was fairly politically minded. You know, I was fairly well educated on politics, and I like talking about political issues even then. You know, but if you want to play in that arena, you have to play by the rules. So, you know, fair enough. Newsweek noted his popularity too. At the start of 2018, the magazine published an article type titled Trump's Mini Me's. Okay. The article's subtitle described a girl named M.M., the alt-right deployed a 12-year-old Trump supporter to interview Alabama Republican nominee Roy Moore on the eve of the special Senate election. She's not the only kid in this weird little army. I, I'm not sure how the alt-right can deploy MM or anyone else. The alt-right is not like a cohesive group that can like name people, or they're not like you know a, a group with a with a like leadership structure. They're a description of some kind of segment of the right which I'm not even quite sure what segment of the right it is, because given some of the language from people who use it, the alt-right appears to be uh, the same thing as all the right. So, you know, but the alt-right doesn't really have the power to nominate people. The top of the article featured a large photo of CM holding up a Trump campaign sign, and the fourth column displayed a photo of MM. The caption below next to CM's picture read, Just kidding. Both CM left and MM seen here with primetime Fox News host Laura Ingram have gone viral with videos in which they tell all things Trump. Here are the first two paragraphs of fold, the first two paragraphs of the article. All right, watch MM or CM, both of them 12, expound about their love of President Donald Trump and the platforms and candidates he endorses. Most recently, MM deployed to Alabama. I don't know how, de I don't know how you get deployed, but whatever. Most recently, MM deployed to Alabama for a cute, if it wasn't so contextually creepy interview with Senate candidate Roy Moore. I, I, I kind of object to that, right? I, I think, each, you know, again, when I was 12, 11, I was fairly politically minded. And if this 12-year-old wants to have political opinions, you know, so much the better. You know, it's I, I don't object to a young person having opinions. I just think that they should be treated in the adult arena. I don't believe treating them with special rules. So this is like one of my objections to Greta Thunberg. 
right? I don't object to Greta Thunberg having political opinions. I do object when people try to protect her because she's a kid, right? It's like, if you want to play in the adult arena, like you play by adult rules. So like, if you want to engage in this kind of commentary, that's fine. Right. I will. I won't necessarily assume that your opinions aren't your own. Now, we may find evidence that your opinions are not there and we may find evidence that you're a mouthpiece. Right. But if you want to play in this game, right, we can play. You can play by the same rules everyone else does. So, like, should Greta Thunberg be allowed to talk about political issues? Sure. But you then you can't hide behind. Well, she's just a girl, though, or she's just young, though, or she's just a child, though. No, 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 no. If she's expressing her own views, she has to play by the same rules as everyone else. So I don't really like this idea that we are necessarily automatically concluding that CM or MM are not expressing their own views. Maybe they are plants. Maybe they are just mouthpieces. Maybe their parents are using them as props. Maybe their views really aren't their own. I mean, that's a fair view. That's a fair question. But their views may very well be their own because when I was 10, 11, 12, I definitely had views of my own and I would have expressed them much more poorly than I do now. But nevertheless, I had views that I would want to express. So like the idea that you could have a young person who wants to play in this arena doesn't seem for fully foreign to me. You'll notice that both these young children speak like Trump. And like him, they seem very comfortable in front of cameras. Which, you know, why not? They've, they're 12. They've had cameras in front of them all their lives. You know, the smartphones have been around forever. Yeah, here M.M. on Trump. Here's M.M. on Trump in 2017 interview with Jenna Lawrence, vice president of the American America First Project, a populist national super PAC. OK, quote, one of the other reasons I like him is because and this is my favorite reasons we will build a wall on our southern borders and, and Mexico. No buts about it, Mexico will pay for the wall or CM to Infowars Alex Jones last October, which incidentally, I recently learned that Infowars is based in Austin. So I guess I have to give him a call now or something. By the way, I saw your interview with Megyn Kelly. You got her good. You got her good. She thought she was going to make a fool of you, but you turned it around and you proved her to be a liar. Both instances demonstrate how Trump supporters are recruiting children as spokespeople. I, again, I don't know that this is necessarily fair. Um, I, I do think that I do think that's, that adults look for children to espouse their views because then you can't attack the children because they're children, right? So you'll see like You'll see what I object to is the young children who are holding up signs at a Hillary or a Trump rally. And then like you try to attack the points and be like, but you're attacking kids, though. No, that's not that's not fair. Like you can't have it both ways. If you want to participate, you participate, but you participate on the same rules. Alex Jones, once he got done digressing to his 12 year old guest about Kelly's hotness, hailed CM as part of a new wave resistance to the globalists, a term anti-defamation league considers to be an anti-Semitic dog, dog whistle. I, I'm not sure, like, how that's anti-Semitic, being globalist or nationalist, you know, and the ADL has their own issues with freedom of speech, God knows to be sure. But, like, I no, I mean, that doesn't strike me as either pro or anti-Jewish people to say globalist or nationalist. I mean, you, you, can, you can be a nationalist and think that Israel should have a strong nation. You can be a globalist and think that, you know, Israel should be part of a global community. And it doesn't strike me as inherently um, anti-Semitic, no. These kids are being weaponized, says Tan Gitlin, professor of journalism and sociology at Columbia Universal, Columbia University, which, you know, again, I don't necessarily object to that characterization, but I, I'm willing to bet that Todd here wouldn't say the same thing about Greta Thunberg. It's, so, so, Gre so, so MM and CM are being weaponized, but not Greta Thunberg. That's, that's the kind of thing I object to. Again, special pleading. He says the MMCM interviews camouflage positions of the hard right as feel good sweetness and light when in fact they're defending raw racism and sexual abuse. No, that's that's totally not fair. You know, these these positions are not just raw racism and sexism and to reduce it to that is just intellectually lazy. So no. These were the only paragraphs that named CM, though seven other paragraphs named MM. The article quoted Professor Gitlin throughout. And halfway through, he said, what I find repulsive is featuring children as spokesperson. That's hiding behind children. Well, I, I do agree to the extent that you're not treating the children's views as legitimate participants. I don't like this idea that children should be allowed to speak and then that they can be safe from criticism. No, no, no. No, that's not fair. You know, if children want to express a view, that's fine. But, you know, they want to express it as part of the polity and they have to participate by the rules. We're not. I do not believe that children should be specially guarded 
from their views. You know, if they want to participate, that's fine. Um, but, you know, they should be held accountable for their views, just the same as anyone else. The professor's quotations also appear in the article's last two paragraphs. These kids are reveling in the chance to show off. They're getting the chance to be little celebrities. If a kid is reading a chapter and verse of a text written by someone else and circumventing grown-up questions, I think it's bait and switch politics. You know, fair enough, but this isn't exactly a unique kid problem. There are plenty of adults who are non-player characters too, who are just merely reading something written by someone else and haven't done the thought. So there are a lot of adult NPCs. So if you want to say that these children are NPCs, they may very well be. And that's a unique, that's a legitimate criticism. Although they may have thoughts of their own, because God knows I did. There's a sinister quality to this. Kids are being seduced with the promise of being celebrities. Or also they just legitimately think those things. Because, again, no one was interviewing me about anything when I was 12. But I still had thoughts. In this case, the instigators are recruiting for a sort of boy and girl auxiliary, for which they believe a sacred crusade. Or, you know, they're trying to educate young ch kids about the same thing they think, which is, you know, fairly typical in all kinds of things. Politics, religion, whatever, right? Adults are trying to educate kids to philosophies, and sometimes the kids believe it and sometimes not, as sometimes adults do. So it's like, I don't think there's anything particular sinister here. The district court granted Newsweek's motion to dismiss. It reasoned that the professor's statements at the end of the second paragraph did not defame CM. They had not faulted kids, but adults of the hard right. The court read other contested statements as non-actionable opinion. It held that CM had not alleged actual malice. That admission doomed both the false light claim, for which actual malice is an element, and the defamation claim for which actual malice must be shown when the plaintiff is a public figure. CM now appeals. We review the district court's dismissal de novo, taking true the facts as alleged in the complaint. As we're sitting in diversity, which is to say we're dealing with people of different states, diversity jurisdiction, so there's people from multiple states. So the word diversity here has a technical meaning. It doesn't mean anything about race. It means people from different states. As we're sitting in diversity, Pennsylvania law governs. Our job is to predict how Pennsylvania's highest court would decide the case. Yes, because we're in state law action. Fair enough. Fundamentally, defamation is a state cause of action. CM must prove that Newsweek harmed his reputation within the meaning of the state law. Here, that state is Pennsylvania. So for his defamation claim, CM must find seven evidence, seven elements. The statement was defamatory. Newsweek published it. The statement was about CM. Readers would understand the statement as defamatory. Readers would understand the defamatory statements were about CM. A publication harmed him. And Newsweek lacked constitutional privilege to make the statement. You know, yeah, every state recites this a little bit differently, but more or less, these are the factors of defamation everywhere, right? It's a false statement. It's published. People read it. There's some kind of damage, right? So Pennsylvania phrases it a little bit differently, but essentially this is, this is just the standard of defamation. Yeah, okay, fine. The parties only contest the first and third elements, but we need to resolve only the first element, which is whether the articles could be defamatory, right? You need to find all of them, so if you don't have one of them, you don't have the case. Fair enough. While the parties spill much ilk over whether the key statements refer to CM, we need not reach that issue because they must show that they carry a defamatory means. So whether they're about CM or not, you know, we can put aside because they're not defamatory. You know, we'll look for the weakest link in the chain. And if we can resolve it there, then we're done. Each contested statement in the article is an opinion, label, or speculation based on disclosed facts and alleged as no specific wrongdoing. Such statements cannot defame. As the Pennsylvania courts recognize, pure point opinions cannot be defamatory. Under the First Amendment, opinions based on disclosed facts are absolutely privileged no, no matter how derogatory they are. Yes, we've, we've seen this many, many times, right? The line between, between opinion and facts. So if it's opinion, it's protected, right? Because it's not alleging facts. For it to be defamation, it would have to be false. And it can only be false if it's a fact. Opinions can't be false. Opinions are just what they are, right? If it's, if it's my opinion, it's my opinion, right? So they can't be false. So yeah, if if it's opinion, you know, it's opinion. And here the court is saying, look, there's no hidden facts. We've relayed all the facts, facts, and you're just saying what they what your view the what the view is it is, so it's just opinion. Fair enough. That holds true even when an opinion is extremely derogatory, like calling another person's anti-Semitic. So yeah, so that's a statement of opinion, which, you know, I don't think it really is, not for least reasons I understand how it could be, but yeah, that would be an opinion. Not a very good one, but an opinion nonetheless. That privilege makes sense. When an article discloses underlying facts, readers can easily judge the facts for themselves. Yeah, so if the article is relaying all the facts that you need to know, 
and then saying, well, this is our opinion. Well, if you've relayed all the facts, the person can come to a different opinion. As for example, I just did, right? So the article just said, well, here's all the facts. I'm like, I don't think that's anti-Semitic. The article thinks it is. It's like, well, we have a difference of opinion, but we're basing it on the same facts. So like, yeah, we each have the facts. We've reached a different conclusion. Okay. So the Newsweek article did that here, and the opinions expressed are privileged as a result. Yeah. At the heart of this appeal is the first pair of quotations from the professor at the end of the article's second paragraph. These kids are being weaponized, and they're defending raw racism and sexual abuse. Those characterizations follow an article's factual description of MM's interview with Roy Moore and Jennifer Lawrence, vice president of the American First Project and CM's interview, interview with Alex Jones. Only after describing those inter interviews does the author offer the opinion these kids are being weaponized, and the hard right is using their interviews to camouflage defending raw racism and sexual abuse. Yeah, that seems more opinion, particularly in context. Right? It's not relaying facts. We relate all the facts, and now we're saying, well, this is my view of it. Seems reasonable. Yeah, it seems more opinion-oriented than factual-oriented. Those characterizations make no factual claims about CM. The article does not say CM is racist or sexual abuser, nor does it accuse CM of having made any specific statements, defending raw racism and sexual abuse. Instead, it quotes the opinion about how the hard right is using the opinions. His opinion may seem harsh, but it does not strip them of privilege. You know, it may be harsh. I don't necessarily think it's correct, but it is a privileged statement. You know, he's entitled to his opinion. I'm entitled to mine. This is freedom of speech. This is part of the dialogue. I believe in freedom of speech. Yeah, I have no problem with this. In any event, derogatory characterizations without more are not, defamatory, not defamation. Yeah. Take accusations of racism. In Pennsylvania, a simple accusation of racism is not enough. So simply saying someone is racist is an opinion, not a fact, at least as far as Pennsylvania is concerned. Fair enough. Rather, the accusation must imply more. For instance, by suggesting the accuser has personally broken the law to act in a racist manner, or presumably to act in some specific manner that would be racist. So simply saying that someone's racist isn't enough. You'd have to like at least imply something that's factual. Racism is more of an opinion, yeah. But Professor Gitlin alleged no specific unlawful wrongdoing. While saying that someone's committed a crime may be defamatory, public defending those accused of racism is not unlawful. Yeah, fair enough. We still know evidence that Pennsylvania would let defenders of those accused of bigotry bring defamation actions wherever a publication mentions their offense. Oh, fair enough. Whether CM speaks for the hard right, whatever that might be, is incapable of defamatory meaning because it just describes CM's political philosophy. Whether or not it does is a whole other issue, but like it's, it's an opinion, right? The other two statements are professor speculations. Everyone's free to speculate about someone's motivations based on disclosed facts about that person's behavior. Fair enough. You know, he's, it's just speculation that he's been appointed by the alt-right, whatever the alt-right is. I, I personally I personally think that any article that uses the phrase alt-right should have an obligation to, like, define what the difference between alt-right and non-alt-right is. Because you can't have an alt-right in the abstract, right? Alt just means alternative. So, like, to have an alt-right necessarily requires some non-alternative right. So what exactly is the distinction between normal right and alternative right? I'd like, I'd like some of these articles to define that for me. That'd be helpful. Even if some statements in the article were defamatory, CM's claim failed because he did not plead actual malice. To show defamation, a public figure, even if he's a limited purpose public figure like CM, and incidentally here, he did inject himself into the debate, right? He did agree to these interviews. He did, he did conduct these interviews. So he did inject himself into the debate. So he does seem to be limited purpose public figure within the meaning of the law. Yeah. Whether or not that's like ultimately like whether limited purpose should be read that way is a whole nother set of issues. But at least as the law is defined right now, yeah, that would make sense. To show defamation, a public figure must show actual malice. Actual malice is a term of art within defamation law that does not connote ill will or improper motivation. Rather, it requires a publisher to either know the article is false or publish it with reckless disregard. And yeah, I've, I've said before that personally, I don't know that any court has ever phrased it this way, but I personally like saying that in actual malice, the malice is to the truth, not to the person. So the actual malice is to the truth as such. So it's in knowledge of falsity or in, in or you were supposed to know, right? So your malice isn't to the person, your malice is to the truth as such. So I, you know, if I ever become a judge someday, I'm going to be, I'm going to write down by actual malice, we mean malice to the truth, not to the person. See if I can create some new law, because, you know, I think that's a pretty good way to phrase it. CM is a limited purpose public figure. He voluntarily injected himself into the controversies, and the public presence critics enjoy significantly greater access to channels of effective communication than his peers. Yeah, fair enough. 
CM's false light claims fares no better. Opinions based on true disclosed facts cannot support a false light claim unless they create a false impression. In Pennsylvania, falsely means the same thing for false light as it does for defamation. In both contexts, opinions cannot be false. So false light requires malice as a built-in element. So there's no like, there's no separation between public figures and non-public figures in, in, in false light law in Pennsylvania. Either one, they both have to show malice. In either way, you didn't have malice to the truth. Again, false light requires it to be false. And for something to be false or true requires a fact. So you can't be in a false light unless it's false, which implies fact. You know, so if, it, if it's just opinion, it's not false light. And there's no malice either. So, yeah, you lose on both grounds. It makes sense to me. In the rough and tumble of politics, CM must endure offensive opinions and heated rhetoric. The First Amendment protects even the most derogatory opinions because suppressing them would show public discourse. Yes, it would. Free speech protects everyone. That's the whole point. So we can't suppress anyone's opinion. And that's a good thing. The First Amendment protects even the... Yeah, as long as the opinion relies on disclosed facts, as long as you tell us the facts, it's privilege, right? If you hide the facts, it could be read to imply hidden facts, but if you tell us the facts, you can have any opinion you want. CM did not please news where it knew the facts were false or recklessly disregarded. We will thus affirm. So that is the end of our coverage of the case of Brian McCaffrey versus Newsweek. In this case, we learned that CM, a young minor who was only 11 at the time or 12 at the time, um, was talking about Trump and got some national recognition. Talked with Laura Ingram, talked with Alex Jones, conducted some interviews, talked with Roy Moore, you know, a bit of a bit of a child star, as it might relate to uh, the media. And because of all the ways that he engaged in this public discourse, Newsweek took note and wrote an article about him. Uh, they gave all the facts and then they came up with some opinions that were unfriendly. Uh, he's suing because of the opinions being unfriendly, but a CM has learned and a CM should appreciate Freedom of speech protects everyone. It protects his right to have opinions about the left. And it protects the left's opinions, ability to have them about the right. And so CM cannot sue for defamation or false claims, uh, both because there were no statements of fact. And even if there were, they weren't in a false, they weren't made with malice because they reported on the facts as they occurred on in the interviews. So there's nothing here to sue over. So CM cannot recover. And that's the end of our coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.